everybody. Um, welcome to week five of digital learning. This week we're learning about food webs, food chains, um, energy pyramids, ecological relationships, and all that good jazz. So here we go. remember that a predator is something that's going to be eating something else and the prey is the thing that's being eaten. Okay? A food chain starts with a producer. A producer is an organism that is an autotroph, which means that it makes its own food. A plant. So all of our food chains and our food webs start with producers. Producers are Typically, our plants, they are autotrophs, which means they can make their own food. Um, they do so in the process of photosynthesis by taking um, carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight um, that produces oxygen and glucose. Remember, we as animals don't um, get to go through photosynthesis. We are not autotrophs. Instead, we have to eat our food in order to obtain glucose. consumer, this grasshopper here. Consumers are heterotrophs, which means that they need to feed on other organisms. Um, here our grasshopper is the primary consumer in this food chain. It's next in line and primary means first and consumer. It consumes something, it eats something. These are our heterotrophs and heterotrophs are organisms that cannot produce their own glucose via photosynthesis. Therefore, they have to eat. So we are heterotrophs just like the grasshopper. The primary consumer is eaten by a secondary consumer, this frog. The secondary consumer is eaten by a tertiary consumer, this snake. So if we look at this food chain here, notice that it goes in one line and is one chain. It starts with the producer, goes to the primary consumer, the secondary consumer, and then the tertiary consumer. This word right here, tertiary, um, is just a fancy way of saying third. And then secondary is the fancy way of saying second, and primary is the fancy way of saying first. So they all have an order, as you can see in the chain here, um, but all of our consumers consume, so they eat something else. They do not make their own glucose, um, and they're all, and that's what heterotrophs mean, which is why they're all considered heterotrophs. The producer here is always first in line, and it is an autotroph, so that means that it can make its own glucose via the sun and other raw materials. And the food chain can keep going. Notice how the arrows are supposed to point in the direction of the one doing the eating, which makes sense because that's the direction of the energy flow. So energy arrows are always drawn uh, to the person that is eating. So if you look up here, you can see, I think this is pinky, um, the energy arrows going into the mouth of the predator. So that's why it goes to like the one that's eating. So the grasshopper eats the producer, so the arrow points to the thing that's eating it. The frog eats the grasshopper, so the arrow's pointed to the frog, and the snake eats the frog, which is why the arrow is pointed to the snake. So wherever the arrow points, that's the thing that is eating it. You can also arrange the same food chain into an energy pyramid. The producers are at the base here, in trophic level one. They actually contain energy. What is crazy to think about is the primary consumers here in trophic level two, they actually only store 10% of the energy from the producers. Meaning, let's say the plants here had 10,000 kilocalories. That's an energy unit of energy. Well, the next level here, the primary consumers in trophic level two, they would only 
only store 1,000 kilocalories of energy. So where did the rest of the energy go? Much of it is lost in heat or undigested. If you go up to the secondary consumers... So before they talk about the other layers of this pyramid, um, so this is the energy pyramid. It's just another way to display um, the transfer of energy, just like a food chain. You can see that this is our first level, and this is all of our producers, things that are autotrophs, can make their own glucose via photosynthesis. And then we go to trophic level two, which has our grasshopper, which is our primary consumer and a heterotroph. Trophic level three, which is our secondary consumer, also a heterotroph. And then trophic level number four, which is our tertiary consumers. Remember, fancy word for third, um, a heterotroph, because also consuming. And they're also saying that only 10% of the energy from the level below gets transferred to the level above it. And it goes like that for every single level. So if there was 10,000 kilocalories, that's what it says right down here, 10,000 kilocalories in trophic level one, only 10% of that energy is going to be able to pass up to trophic level two, meaning there's going to be one less zero than there was in trophic level one. So we go from 10,000 to 1,000. We lost this zero here. In trophic level two, the same thing is going to happen where we lose 10%. So we'll go from 1,000 kilocalories to 100, drop another zero. And then here we would have 100 uh, kilocalories that would drop down to just 10, losing another zero. Um, and when we say losing, that is not quite correct because we know that um, matter is not going to be created or destroyed. So nothing is, it's not like it just disappears. It's actually going to be lost to heat or used in digestion or some of it might just not digest and just remain in the organism. Um, so it's not like actually lost, gone forever. It's just lost from this particular pyramid. It's not being transferred up as efficiently. So notice that you've got to have a lot of kilocalories in trophic level one to get just a few, 10, up in trophic level number four. So that's why there are so many more producers in plants than there are um, organisms in, or like uh, grasshoppers, consumers, frogs, snakes, whatever um, in the world. So in trophic level three, that would be only 100 kilocalories of energy. So as you go up each trophic level, it's roughly only 10% of the energy from the trophic level below that will be stored. Back to our food chain. Notice that like a domino effect, if something is removed, let's say the grasshoppers, you can harm the others because they might not have enough to eat. You really have to consider the relationships among organisms in a food chain. In fact, even if you took out the apex predator in this particular food chain, which Apex predator just means the predator that's at the top of the food chain. So in this case, it was the snake, but it could be a variety of different things in different food webs and chains. Which is the snake. You could end up with an excessive population of frogs, and so many frogs that it's possible they wouldn't have enough grasshoppers to even support them. So every um, population and ecosystem has something called a carrying capacity. And a carrying capacity is something... Um, Basically, it's the number that a particular environment can hold of something. So in this food chain, if we take away the snakes, that takes away the predator for the frogs, and then they can reproduce kind of rapidly and kind of take over. But at some point, there will be a limit on how many frogs can exist, and that would be our carrying capacity, uh, because there aren't enough grasshoppers for those frogs to eat. So everything in the food chain is like a domino effect and affects each other. You know, this is actually not a very good model because in real life, this snake probably doesn't just eat frogs. It probably eats rabbits and birds too. Because an ecosystem doesn't typically have a single food chain. Instead, it has more of a food web. A food web is made up of multiple food chains that interact together. So notice how now we have multiple food chains here tied in with our original to make a food web. The beauty of a food web is that it shows more interactions among a variety of producers. So food webs are more symbolic of real life. 
um, because a chain is just singular and linear. You can see the food web here is very interconnected. We now have three producers or things that are autotrophs and make their own glucose. And we now have five consumers, the grasshopper being our primary, um, the bird and the bunny and, well, actually, if I follow this right, okay, the bunny is actually a primary consumer as well. It only eats from the plants. So grasshopper and bunny are primary. Um, secondary would be both our bird and our frog because they eat the primary consumers. And then tertiary, we still just have the snake because he eats the secondary consumers. But this is more, much more symbolic of real life. At various level consumers, it also can show biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of organisms. Which we've talked about all, all types of organisms year long. Living in a given area. The size of the area that we're talking about, as well as the climate of the area, directly affect the biodiversity that is present. Biodiversity can contribute to the sustainability of an ecosystem. What I mean by that is, let's say there was a decrease in the amount of small birds in this food web. Well, it's likely that will be harmful to other organisms. However, it is not the only thing that the snakes feed on. They have other options because of the biodiversity. The snakes also eat rabbits and they eat frogs. So because of this biodiversity, the ecosystem might be more resilient to changes such as these. And so this is another super important thing about biodiversity. We've talked about biodiversity and genetic variability and how it's so important for particular organisms to have diversity within themselves, like specific species. But even in a food chain and a food web, it's good too. Because now you saw on our food chain here um, that the snake actually had more than just one option. So if the bird population decreased, the snakes would probably still be able to survive because of the frog and the bunny. So this is another way by why biodiversity is just so, so important in life. And possibly recover. However, these changes can still have detrimental effects, and it's why it's critical to protect ecosystem biodiversity. High biodiversity has a lot of other benefits that can include economics, and we'll need another video to really touch on all the benefits of high biodiversity. So if we were to ask you which of our examples here had more biodiversity, our food chain here or our food web, you would definitely want to pick the food web. One last thing, there are some organisms that we left out of our food webs and food chains, but they're kind of a big deal. Decomposers. Decomposers are heterotrophs since they do eat other things, even if the things they're eating are dead. Decomposers include organisms like bacteria and fungus. Technically, if we were to draw them in, then every arrow here would eventually point to them. All right, so we forgot to mention decomposers. Decomposers are considered heterotrophs because they are technically eating things. Just the things they are eating are dead. So they still do need to get their um, glucose sources from other organisms. They don't do photosynthesis. Therefore, they are not autotrophs. They are heterotrophs. But if you draw them in your food web, at the end of the day, all of the arrows point to them because when any of these things perish, uh, the mushrooms and the fungus and the bacteria will break them down. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we remind you to stay curious. All right, that's it for um, today's video. So, yeah, bye.